This week, I'm in San Sebastian. Spain's culinary hotspot, tasting my way through all the pinchos and finding out how to pay like a local. Papa. Papa. We hear about the positive effects of travel on our mental health. I feel on top of the world. Fantastic. And Rajans in Saudi Arabia exploring Jeddah's historic district. San Sebastian, the Basque country's holiday playground, tucked away up here on the Bay of Biscay. It's really stunning. There are three beaches with coastal hiking trails, but what people really come here for is the food. This northern Spanish city holds one of the highest number of Michelin stars per square metre in the world, and they also claim to have the most bars per person. So this place sounds right up my street. And the Basques have their own way of eating too. It's all about Pinchos. My guide to the Pinchos scene is Luis. He grew up in San Sebastian and he runs Pincho food tours. So this is my first time trying Pinchos. How, how does it all work? Well, Pinchos is our tradition. Uh, it's the way of socialize and meet friends, uh, changing very quick from one bar to another, one bar, one drink, mm -hmm. one Pincho. Let me show you inside the, right. the varieties that we have. So I can see a lot of food, it all looks really good, but what's going on? Wow, it's not easy because there are a lot of possibilities. On the counter we have the fresh pinchos, mm -hmm. and if you follow the blackboard, uh, we have the warm food, oh. the warm pinchos that come directly from the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And this is all made today, daily, yeah, very, very, very made fresh. throughout the day? And maybe in 20 minutes or half an hour, they need to, you know, uh, renew mm -hmm. the, the pinchos that you can see on the counter because yeah. always it's full of people and it's very, very fresh. As a tourist who comes to San Sebastian, they're not really sure how pinchos works. Explain to me what is what are the rules? Okay, first, go where the locals go. Mm -hmm. Second rule is one bar, one drink, one pincher. And the third rule, uh, ask the waiter for the speciality because every week change, every season change the pinchos. Yeah. And it's very interesting if you ask the waiter which is the speciality, the speciality today. But recently, an undercover investigation by a local journalist caught some pincho bars double pricing. Two tourists went out and ordered the exact same dishes as two locals who ordered in the Basque language. Over the night, the tourists paid about nine euros more. The experiment was conducted twice in the same month at seven of the Old Town's Pincho bars. So let's talk about that investigation. You know, we've got to talk about it. How did the locals react to that? Yeah, I think it's interesting to have this uh, information because we can, the locals, we can boycott uh, these bars that uh, make a different price for locals and, uh, and tourists. No? For us, it's very important to give the best service. Yeah, of course. Not only for locals, also for travelers from all over the world. Most of the Pincho bars are in the old town. In fact, there are more than 200 to pick from, which can be a little overwhelming. But it all becomes clear when you have someone to explain how it works. OK, so talk to me about pricing, because I can see prices on the board here, but there's no prices here. So how does it all work? Yeah, the pinchos that you can see on the counter, you can take by yourself directly uh, without waiting the waiter. Mm -hmm. And you can take one, two or three, uh, uh, whenever you want. And before leaving, you can say to the waiter how many pinchos have you eaten uh, and pay for that. Yeah, so people can come in, they don't need to wait to be served, they can take the food and then based on this trust system, you pay for what you've eaten and drank and then you leave. Yeah, because normally the people is very honest because it's not normal in other yeah, big no. cities especially. No, no. I've, I've, never come, I've never come across a system yeah. like this before, yeah. So very trustworthy. Yeah, and also it's easy for the waiters because 
price is normally is the same mm -hmm. for all the variety of pinches. And if you say three, it's yeah. three euros for three is nine euros, you know? Pinchos isn't all about the old town and tradition. Luis takes me to meet a chef who's putting a modern twist on it all. Hi, hola, ¿qué tal? Very well, and you? Very well. Nice to meet you. Igualmente. <laughs> so, Aispia, are you, are you from San Sebastian? Do you live here? Sí, sí, soy nacida aquí, vivo aquí, Donostiarra. So what's the secret to good pinchos? El secreto de, de hacer buenos pinchos, el secreto básico es primero que te guste comer. Disfrutar de la comida, disfrutar de lo que te dan en otros sitios y que te guste comer, para luego poder cocinar. Al final nosotros lo que hacemos es, eh, lo que más nos gusta es la, ver la cara de los clientes cuando comen un pincho que está elaborado o uno tradicional y les guste. ¿no? Entonces al final lo, la, lo básico es que te guste comer y, y cocinar con amor. Gracias. All in one? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Before I leave, Luis took me to one of his favorite places and has one more thing in store. Just for finish the tour, mm -hmm. uh, I have a surprise for you. Ooh, a surprise, huh? I like surprises. This is a temple for T-bone stick lovers, but we will try cider. Hola. Hola. How are you? Okay. Hola. My friend. Nice to meet you. San Sebastian is full of cider houses. Yeah. Some of them more than 500 years old. It takes a certain amount of skill to pour like that. Why we do that? Because we love to drink the cider with the bubbles. Okay. Mm, I'm okay. all about the bubbles. Okay. Yes. Topa. Topa. Wow, it's very nice. fresh. Mm, very fresh. Well, we're off to Thailand next for a taste of an annual festival that reaches for the skies in a homemade kind of way. And just a word of warning, please don't try this at home. นี่เกี่ยวแก่กับโบราณเป็นรถอยู่ตรงไฟขึ้นทั้งฝ่าฝนกี่ตกเป็นฝ้าเห็ดมากอ่ะเป็นร้อยปี 200 ปีมาแล้วนะเต้นนงดงล่ะ to come How traveling can help when you're feeling blue and Rajan's getting stuck in Saudi style. I seem to be part of the band, which is great. No idea what I'm doing. So don't go away.
So I'm watching a couple of guys play Pelota, um, which is a Basque game here in Spain. <laughs> They're really giving it some welly. They're really whacking that ball. I'm about to have a go. Not sure how good I'd be at this stage, but so far I'm feeling confident. Hi guys, how's it going? So talk to me about Pelota, what is it? Well, this is a traditional sport here, and this is a traditional place where we play this this sport mm. that we play with a wooden pail, with a basque pilot. Oh, so there's different ways to play, there are different methods. Uh, you could play also with, uh, with your own hands. Ah, sounds painful. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you need a lot of strength and motivation. <laughs> Okay, so can you teach me how to play? Sure, you're welcome. I'm ready. Let's go. All right, we have a bat. Oh, that is weighty. <laughs> Off comes the jacket. I feel like it's about to get hot. I'm just fling it over here. Yeah. So, the rules. Well, it's very easy. You just take the play like this. Mm -hmm. This must be outside. Yep. And you need to hit the ball as strong as you can, okay? The ball must hit that big wall in front of you. <laughs> and above the black line, mm -hmm. always. Okay. If it bounces out the white line, it's your fault. It can bounce only once, mm -hmm. and you will score points one by one till 22. Okay? Sounds simple enough. Let's play. <laughs> Now, most of the Northern Hemisphere has just experienced Blue Monday, the day of the year thought to be the most depressing. But there are ways to combat it. Some say exercise, others make time for mindfulness. But we've met one man whose cure lay on the open road. I'm a big believer in the power of travel in terms of managing sort of depression, anxiety, these, these mental health issues that many of us will, will encounter. Being immersed in nature, being in new places, having new experiences, these things can be really beneficial to mental health. My name is Jake Tyler. I'm a mental health advocate and campaigner. And two years ago, I walked 3,000 miles around mainland Great Britain. Out walking, brilliant. What you do, right, is you put one foot in front of the other for a period of time, and your whole body, your arms, your face, all of it, it just goes exactly where you want it to go. I try and do that as often as I can. The, the feeling of sadness just goes, and I feel on top of the world. Fantastic! I went through a mental health crisis point I guess. Working in a job that I felt a lot of pressure to perform well at, mismanaging my stress with poor lifestyle choices and crucially not giving myself the things in life that I need to balance me out. Things like nature, exploring, adventure, these sorts of things. The idea to walk around the whole of Great Britain came about because I felt like I needed a part of my day to be, you know, for me to be in control of it, basically. So I decided to do all the national parks. I, I bought a map and I just started circling all these just amazing parts of Britain, natural Britain that I thought, you know, would maybe influence or inspire people to get outside. I just put a big line through them all. And then there was this route, 3,000 miles from Brighton to Brighton, a lap of Great Britain, and set off two months later. It wasn't just this big, exciting adventure the whole time. There were times when I still really did struggle out there. Yesterday was, I don't know, I think I'm going to write it off. I just woke up in the morning feeling really, really anxious about everything and um, I couldn't really shake it all day. Anxiety, man, it's, it's a pain in the arse. You know, it's so irrational, it's so... You know, you can't, you can't apply logic when you're feeling like that. You can try, but the anxiety is just like, no, you're wrong, that's not true, you're not gonna be fine, you're gonna get killed, and no one's gonna find you. Uh, which, you know, shut up, anxiety. Before you know it, you're sort of consumed by all these negative emotions, 
Um, and, and that's something that can happen when you're traveling. You know, the way to get around that is to try not to beat yourself up for having those feelings because those sorts of feelings transcend where you are geographically. Like you are gonna, you are gonna end up having to deal with those sorts of feelings wherever you are. For me personally, I, I feel, I feel I'm sort of blessed with a sense of adventure that I thrive on new experiences, and and so travelling for me is just it makes it makes sense to do. Finally, we're in the Red Sea port of Jeddah, the gateway to Saudi Arabia's holy cities of Mecca and Medina. Last year, the authorities relaxed travel restrictions, making a visit to this part of the world much easier. Rajan's been exploring some of what the kingdom has to offer. It's been a fishing village since the 6th century, then a major Red Sea trading post. But today, Jeddah is Saudi's commercial capital and the second biggest port in the Arab world. But wander into the historic district and you'll find centuries of intrigue. The old city, known as Al Balad, was a thriving multicultural centre with distinctive architecture. Some homes and mosques date as far back as the 7th century. If I could play backgammon, I'd be admiring every move, I'm sure. But these guys, I think they know what they're doing. <laughs> Jeddah is different, is the city's motto, and the coral stones built into the fabric of the old city's buildings and wall testify to that. Today, as part of its grand Vision 2030 programme, Saudi is attempting to become an appealing tourist destination, and the regeneration of old Jeddah is central to those plans. Jeddah's always been attractive to immigrants, both for the Hajj and work. People from Yemen and African countries like Ethiopia and Somalia make for a vibrant, bustling street culture. <laughs> Sami is the director of Al Balad, and it's been his life's mission to revive the area. Now, Sami, you are so passionate yourself about the rejuvenation of this area, the preservation of the history. Why? Oh God, because, first of all, I am local. I am the fifth generation of my family house, and my grandfather moved from another family in Jeddah. So I grew up and I lived, and I had a very great life when I was young in the old city. And this is one of the reasons for my passion for the old city of Jeddah. Sami even drove a taxi around here, picking up tourists partly to improve his English. But the decline started in the 60s and 70s when the oil economy started booming and people moved out to modern houses in newer, bigger urban areas. So a few people still live here though now? Very few. Very few. Very okay. few. So now then, what is the aim? How do you want this city to look like in 20, 30 years time? We are working in, in a master plan to protect the city, to encourage people to come, to bring students from the university to live here, to also, uh, there is a lot of land, um, uh, as, uh, uh, sea that backfilled. We want to take that filling out and bring the sea to the facade of the city as it was in 50 years ago. But also, we have to be careful, it doesn't become a Disneyland. Okay, Sheikh Rajan, how about you come and visit my house and maybe we have some surprise. OK, I'd be delighted, thank you. All right. The streets are quite narrow here, so Sammy uses a golf buggy to wend his way around. So here we go, Sammy knows everybody here. No. <laughs> no. I think you do. For example, he's a man about town. You can also rent them if you come and visit this neighbourhood and prefer not to walk in the heat. <laughs> do you like doing this? Yes. <laughs> Actually, this isn't quite his house. It used to be the old royal residence and is now more a cultural heritage site. But Sami's family are the custodians and he has the key. So you can hear the 
call to prayer, the evening call to prayer now, echoing on all the buildings around us. It's an incredible effect, it's just coming at you from all angles, and it's really kind of beautiful music. So, Sammy, that, that wasn't the surprise, was it? No, that's one of the surprises, and we have another one waiting for you downstairs. Okay, well, what is it? We'll see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow, what's this? This is the folklore, this is the surprise, the folkloric dance, local of our area. And we hope you participate with us and we dance together and you play the drums since you are a very good musician. I, I wouldn't say that, but I prefer the drums. <laughs> very good. The whole rhythm is Hijaz, Magam Hijaz, and it is very old Arabic. It comes from an ancient music. OK, now I've got a very strong feeling this is a lot harder than it looks to play. Do you have somebody who can, who can yes. teach me? Yes. Yeah. OK. The first one to mm. the boundary, to the rim. Ah. So this comes to the rim and you close it. Close your fingers. Yeah. And the other one you open and in the center. Yes. Okay. Let me get the first one, right? Okay. And then? Yep. As is tradition, when music like this plays, people are invited to come and listen. This time, we've got some visiting tourists. So, I seem to be part of the band, which is great. No idea what I'm doing. As you can tell, I didn't escape the dancing, if that is what you want to call it. And thankfully, another tourist took my spot. I'm much happier in the background, banging the drum. time for today but join us next week when we're on the slopes of Mount Etna one of the world's most active volcanoes it's been an earthquake and meeting the people who live and work alongside some truly terrifying geological forces so do catch us for that if you can but until then from me and the rest of the travel show team here in San Sebastian it's goodbye